Good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Expert Dialogue, all about COVID-19 from testing to clinical management, presented by wonderful Belltech. First of all, thank you all for taking your time out and being here today. This is Janice from Wonderful Belltech, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. So we all know that it's already been a year and a half since the outbreak of COVID-19. And from the very beginning, we know nothing about this coronavirus, but a highly contagious respiratory disease. All thanks to the efforts of scientists around the world, and we have gained so much more knowledge about coronavirus so far. And especially with the popularization of vaccines, detection strategies has also evolved and changed accordingly. But the situation of this epidemic um, in different countries, they are not quite the same. And some countries had it under quite good control through a series of measurements like um, large scale screening or quarantine or like um, cities lockdown. And these measurements did prove to be effectively um, prevent the spread of the virus. But however, so for some country, the situation are not that satisfying. And they're facing even more serious problems like uh, medical system, like uh, overwhelmed medical system and shortage of vaccines, um, uh, even not to mention the diagnostic reagents. And uh, so therefore we can see that a series of questions will arise like um, how should we adjust our current diagnostic methods and how to conduct the most efficient strategies and how, to, how do we monitor the physical condition of COVID-19 patients? So to address these questions, here we invited two experts from uh, this field to share their insights on the te testing strategy uh, and clinical management of uh, COVID-19 patients. And now please allow me to introduce our speakers. And the first one is Dr. Joseph Scheiber from Germany. He is the founder and managing director of BioVariance, and he will talk about the testing strategy for COVID-19 in Germany. And Dr. Joseph, you can say hi to our audience. Hello, hello everyone, and thanks a lot for the opportunity uh, to be able to present some of our work in an overview of the general ongoings here in Germany. Thank you, Dr. Schaber. And the second one is Amir Ijaz from Pakistan. He is the professor of chemical pathology in Mufiuddin Islamic Medical College. And he will talk about the biomarkers for monitoring of COVID-19 patients clinical management. And Professor Amir, you may say hi to our audience now. Hello, hello everyone. I can see hi. a lot of participants and uh, thank you very much Wonfu, uh, Amber and Janice for inviting us uh, on this webinar. And uh, from two different parts of the world, uh, we are here together to how to hand, tackle this menace. Thank you very much. Thank you as well. So thank both of you for joining us today. Um, before we officially get started, just a few housekeeping notes. To ensure the best audio quality, please turn volume up. And at the end of the webinar, we will have a Q&A session. So if you have any questions during the presentation, you can either submit your question to Q&A section or directly add them to the chat. And me and my colleague will sort these questions out and then deliver, to, uh, deliver them to our experts. And if you miss anything, also don't be worried. A recorded version of this webinar will be uploaded then to um, YouTube one full official account. So now let's get straight into the content. And um, Dr. Joseph, you may go ahead. You want me to share my slides now, correct? Yes, you may share your screen now. Just to make sure you're seeing the first slide now. Yes, oh, okay. we've already seen that. Okay, thank you very much again for this opportunity to present about uh, the strategy here in Germany and some of the very local specifics we had in the region where I'm sitting, where I will say a few more words about that. And um, yeah, I'm look, also looking forward to a discussion afterwards. But now uh, let's dive in into the agenda. So I will give a um, brief background and intro from the localization and how the whole thing developed how this testing strategy developed over the time, what the outcome was and is, 
and around specific time, timelines and then further focus specifically also on antigen testing on how this has been uh, used here in Germany is still being used and also speak about the very interesting study we did uh, with uh, the uh, rapid test from one fold based on our testing center here and the results and so on. So I'm, I will go through the slides now, but I'm also looking forward to a discussion afterwards and I'm also available for question whenever needed. So as this is a very international webinar, uh, let me first show where we are located. So if we take a map of Europe and see Germany here, the easiest is to where I'm sitting, draw a line from Rome to Copenhagen, draw another line from Paris to Prague, and maybe another one from Amsterdam to Vienna, which are some of the more well-known cities here in Europe. And where these lines cross, this is where I'm sitting right now. If we move into the map of Germany, it's also kind of halfway between Munich and Berlin and Frankfurt and Prague, part of the Nuremberg metropolitan region, which is one of the economically strongest regions here in Germany. Basically, we are located here in the heart of uh, Central Europe. So the geographical uh, center of um, Europe is about five kilometers from here. Um, so, um, and I will speak about some specific challenges we had and how the whole story with COVID developed. So how did it start? There was the local Bavarian carnival holiday end of February 2020, so uh, one and a half years ago. And a very popular tourist destination at this time of the year is Ischgl in Austria, which is about four hours south from here where quite a few people uh, were traveling there and there was one super spreader event because one barkeeper there in the most frequented bar was one of the first cases of COVID here in Austria or Germany. So from there, it quickly made from the tourists its way to the region where I'm sitting now, the Tirschenreuth district, one of Germany's 400 districts. And one week later, if you look at the date, there was a, this is a yearly beer festival that is very common and also see many people dancing and having fun. So very easy for a virus to spread and nobody knew already that the virus was there. Even they were ad advertising the event as fun as a oral vaccination against the virus, it says here in Germany, which turned out to not be very smart because uh, it caused quite a few cases. So um, maybe I do it that way. Um, because two weeks later, uh, the first lockdown for a town in Germany that it was announced was the town of Mitterteich where exactly this happened. So, but um, initially, um, what diagnostic methods did we have and what do we have now? Of course, everyone knows about this antibody, antigen and PCR testing. Initially, um, this was a very cold shock. We only had PCR testing available, but getting to a result from the swap took uh, 10 days and longer. Um, quickly a sequencing based methods we had available, but of course, uh, this is also not that brilliant if you need to quickly distinguish uh, between patients and um, non-infected people, because the general strategy is that the local health authorities are contacting and tracing all the contacts of infected people to put all those people under quarantine. So if one person is infected, all contact persons from the last um, 10 days will also be put under quarantine for two weeks. And um, so the region here was hit uh, the first one. We were really uh, literally the first one in Germany to be hit. The first death cases that occurred from the COVID-19 happened here uh, 10 kilometers from here. So we were exposed to that very early on, which then of course led to the fact that the virus and the spread of the virus was studied quite heavily and is still studied quite heavily with antibody tests to see how high the number of previously not discovered infections is 
and particularly in young age people, it turned out uh, that there were so many non-symptomatic cases, um, which explained uh, further spread. So uh, a usual measure uh, people use here is the incidence, meaning the cases for um, uh, infected people in seven days in 100,000 people uh, population. So and we had the highest incidence of that in Germany. And then only later in the year, but I will go into this a bit more detail, also rapid testing became available for professional users. Generally, of course, uh, if you look into the drawbacks and strengths of each the, of the diagnostic methods, PCR is of course the gold standard because it can be implemented relatively quickly, but initially uh, this was not in place. And we had very long turnaround times of around 10 days getting from a swap to diagnosis. Although we were able to sequence positive cases very early on, um, but um, this is not feasible for routine testing. The antibody blood testing became available quicker, uh, but the big advantage of the rapid test with the immediately available results when people have symptoms only became available later in the year. Uh, which I will go into more detail in the further slides. So now we are in March 2020 and we have the first lockdown announced in Germany and the testing situation and also the tracking from the health authorities is uh, a very chaotic situation. So the whole, uh, everyone had to adjust and this is totally new. Nobody had experienced a pandemic before. So all this concept of not being allowed going outside and so on was totally new and desperately looking for solutions for quicker uh, testing and so on. So, of course, one specific point that needs to be mentioned is uh, besides the tracking infections by health authorities that Germany is the most data privacy paranoid country on this planet. So um, the health authorities didn't even have the rights to access all data that was needed, which turned out to be also a problem because in certain cases, people were plainly lying about their contacts and so on. So this has developed better and has become better, but initially caused also very high numbers of uh, infections. Um, which was then also proven by the first, when the first antibody tests became available a few months later um, to show that there were many more people infected. Um, then in June last year, um, we were already quicker. The PCR results took around four days at the time. Um, this is our health minister in Bavaria, Klaus Holicek, they announced a strategy that everyone, um, living here in the state of Bavaria and then was expanded to Germany as well, can test whenever they want, how often they want, and it is being paid for by the state uh, to get a handle on the number of infections and really discover uh, infections early on. And also a uh, lot of testing become compulsory. So people working in elderly care or child care had to uh, have to take three PCR tests a week and so on to really be able to identify cases early on, which then later in the year was also amended with the rapid testing when this became more broadly available. So um, if we now look more locally in um, starting with this implementation here in September, uh, a major player is the Red Cross. Uh, that set up uh, along with people from the army, um, different test centers. So basically every town with above um, 5,000 people or so got its own test center with a high throughput. Um, so, and the, uh, there were still not that many labs available that could do the analysis, but so, um, the swaps were driven daily around the state and the country a couple hundred kilometers to go from the test station locally to the lab. But um, this was already quite good because then the time from a swap to PCR was one and a half uh, days. And at the time, <clears throat> the first professional uh, rapid tests became available. So this was a bit amended that 
who everyone was basically tested uh, every second day or so. And if there was a positive case, immediately a PCR was also taken and the time the result was already a lot quicker. Um, still the numbers were not developing that great, but then when the vaccination campaign started in this, uh, late December last year, we also set up in this building here a concept where a testing station, a vaccination center and a lab are co-located so that the swaps that are being taken can be immediately analyzed. Mm -hmm. And also mm -hmm. in parallel, the rapid tests are being run. So with this integrated concept um, where we got involved, we set up the lab and now uh, usually the time from a swap to PCR result. So if you have a positive rapid test, the PCR is taken and also um, everyone is also taking, uh, who is in a certain profession is taking at least one PCR test a week. And now we are down to two and a half hours between swap and result, which definitely had a major impact. But at the time in February this year, the, the district here, Tischendorf, which is one of the 401 districts here in Germany, had the highest incidence, the highest number of per capita cases in Germany. Um, but it developed very well. Once we had started producing quick results, um, now uh, just three weeks ago, uh, we were also the first uh, district in Germany that got down to COVID zero. And uh, we are maintaining this number since then. So one other interesting part besides the quick test. So if you look into the, <clears throat> the students at schools have to test three times a week, uh, two times it is a, a rapid test, but also then a pooling test with gargling water are performed. So all the students are go just gargling plain water, which is collected and pooled in something like that and then is analyzed by PCR. And only if there is a positive pool, it is further analyzed. And all these measures help us really getting from on the one hand being the one most extreme, having the highest incidence per capita now to having the lowest a few months later with the measures taken. <coughs> and um, now having this availability that the, if you do a quick test with the Red Cross, you get the result immediately also in a digital format. And this is one of the things that has advantages the officially performed test. So you can use the certificate to access gastronomy or certain mm -hmm. uh, places where you need uh, proof that you, have, that you are COVID negative or uh, vaccinated. But um, the, this is the issue now. Also self-tests are very broadly available and very, very affordable, but they are not very popular, unfortunately, although they would be a really great help in finding the further cases um, because there is no official certificate linked to them. If it's a, cell, a test, a, a rapid test being performed by one of the official stations, you have a certificate for 24 hours which you don't have with a self-test. So a concept for that would be very helpful in the future. Also a rapid test for that performs better for non-symptomatic people because the rapid tests are really brilliant if uh, people already have beginning symptoms. Um, if they would also looking more into non-symptomatic people, this would be interesting, of course, here, our very German problem with the data privacy will have to be addressed further. If we look into the current application of the home antigen tests here in Germany, this was very interesting. We basically went from virtually no availability in January uh, to uh, abundant availability. You can now buy these tests everywhere at gas stations, every shop, everywhere you can buy them. Initially, a test was around 20 euros mm -hmm. or even more than that for a common public. Now we are below one euro with the standard price. So um, a drugstore will usually sell these now at maybe 75 cents. But still the real self tests, although they are very beneficial to find cases are um, not so popular due to the lack of a certificate. 
If this can happen in the future, this will of course have way more impact. And then further, this is the strategy that is being uh, pursued here to have a three mm -hmm. levels of testing in the future going from a rapid test and depending on the result of the rapid test, then do a PCR and also later on monitor the antibodies. So now uh, we are at, um, the moment the vaccination um, percentage uh, in Germany is around 53%, um, but we will have to further understand um, the, how do the antibodies is develop the, so the technological quick testing for antibodies and so on will also be very relevant in the future. So, and this uh, brings me to a point to mention one study we did uh, with uh, the actual test from WONFO, where we compared it in uh, 200, more than 250 samples with various cases of positives and negatives uh, with a PCR result. And really in the positive cases uh, with a low CT value, so with a, a significant virus load, uh, the test really performed more or less perfectly. Uh, only if the CT value got um, higher than 30 or 33, the occasional um, problem occurred uh, with the test. But generally, the test really shows we were able to show to a standard gold standard PCR. But if you have a well performing um, a rapid test, you can achieve a very similar results. Uh, at a very quicker time frame, and so if we can solve that issue with the certificate here in Germany, it would probably be no problem to have more or less everyone testing daily um, to have a very, get a very good grasp on the uh, what is going on with the virus. We of course also did some other research with partners, which led to some publications already, particularly about SARS. Of two infections in cancer patients. So very interesting point uh, on one thing we discovered that people under chemotherapy usually don't have uh, symptoms if they are uh, infected with the virus, which is probably related to the fact that the chemotherapy inhibits the DNA polymerase. And as there is no virus growing later on, these people also rarely have antibodies even though they were infected before. So this is also some of the research we did in parallel to this pandemic thing. Maybe another word to the region and the company we are located. So we are in uh, the top 10 uh, highest growth regions in Germany now. Usually 25 years ago, this was directly at the Iron Car Curtain between the East and West Block. Uh, but nowadays, this is, we have a very central location, very high quality of life. Um, BioVariance, the company, we usually don't do COVID, but we did it because it was necessary and we had the local, you know, uh, local uh, expertise. Usually we are active in personalized medicine, in oncology, and therefore also the oncology connection and also neurological applications. So we get some recognition there. And um, basically the team at the time when we started were around, um, so we uh, increased the team size by around 40% during the pandemic to be able to tackle all the different points. Okay, so this brings me to the end of this talk, but I can speak to every detail or give more details to every point you might be interested in. And uh, just feel free to ask uh, either here in the question uh, in the in the session later on or per email and so on later. Okay, thank you very much again for the opportunity here. And then I will stop sharing. This is fine, right? Okay, thank you, Dr. Joseph. Thank you very much. Very interesting sharing. Yeah. So the local testing. Hi. So the yeah. local, yeah, can you hear me? Okay. 
Uh, so the local testing strategy in Germany proves to be very effective, right? So now right after um, a patient is diagnosed with COVID-19 and then the problems will immediately transfer to how to um, like monitor uh, the physical condition of the patients and the, for the uh, clinical management of the patients. So next, uh, let's welcome Professor Amir to share his insights on this topic. Professor Amir, you may share your screen now. Okay, thank you very much. First, uh, thank you. First of all, I want to thank Wonfu and um, Dennis and Amber for giving me this opportunity to talk on <coughs> this very important disease. Uh, I have not made uh, detailed slides of, of uh, location of my country or uh, myself, but just one thing is enough that we have uh, uh, in the north, we have got a great neighbor, a great country, great friend, that is China. I think this introduction is sufficient for uh, about our country, that it is a neighbor of China. And secondly, I just want to narrate uh, one story that and when the COVID started in China, in Wuhan, uh, we had about 5,000 students, uh, Pakistani students studying there. And <clears throat> their parents, uh, they tried their best to um, call their those uh, children back to home. By Chinese authorities, they were very wise and very kind to us. They did not allow them to go back to their countries. Instead, they... Uh, they homed them and they uh, uh, fed them and they, uh, they they made sure that they didn't have a virus and, uh, and so and this thing uh, saved us from a big big uh, crisis so uh, while the other countries they sent their aircrafts and planes to evacuate their own uh, citizens and then those citizens then spread the disease uh, in their countries in Pakistan, uh, COVID did, uh, did uh, bad things, but it, on the peaks, in, in the three peaks, the uh, incidents uh, never went more than 6,500. And uh, uh, we, we, now we are on the uh, below lower side of the third wave, uh, just less than 1,000 cases in the whole country. And uh, we hope that in, uh, just in 30 days, uh, we will be uh, reporting zero case. The topic I'm, I'm, I've shared uh, is close to my heart because uh, by, about the biomarkers, biomarkers for monitoring of patients of COVID-19, the good, the bad, and the ugly. This is the disclaimer. We will have some property names, but just for uh, giving information. Uh, use of biomarkers in COVID-19. A bit of biomarkers are tested in almost all the patients with COVID-19, regardless of clinical indications. As uh, uh, Dennis told in, in the intro that um, the disease, nobody knew exactly what this disease is in the beginning, and we didn't have any clue about it. So a lot of tests were uh, done and in the hope that they will be uh, doing better in the patients. So uh, in almost all the patients, CRP, interleukin-6, procalcitonin, ferritine, LD, and uh, D-dimers, uh, it, it was done. And um, uh, now, but I think it is a time that we should do an audit that whether these uh, biomarkers, all of them should be used or only few of them uh, are useful or some may be used in specific conditions. So today we will carry out an audit of various biomarkers, but first we will, uh, we will discuss some uh, knowledge-based effects, and uh, then we will see which markers were very useful during the pandemic and which caused just waste of money and manpower. So uh, in, in right from the beginning, I will uh, discuss some myths about COVID-19 lab tests. And this is, uh, since I'm a teacher, I am in the bad habit of uh, asking questions. In, in this format, we can ask questions directly from the students. But if you have got a pen and a paper with you, 
please uh, do some critical thinking and write the best answer you have got uh, on your paper. And then you can compare the uh, best answer with your answer. Uh, question number one is a medical researcher is validating, determining diagnose, diagnostic accuracy of various biochemical markers used in patient of COVID-19. Which of the following tests she should use as reference standard, gold standard? Uh, these are the five tests and what do you think should be used as the gold standard? Please write on your paper. Uh, this will keep you uh, uh, awakened and you will be with me throughout the presentation. Yes, uh, gene sequencing is the gold standard. This is a very important thing. So first, myth number one is that RT-PCR is a gold standard for COVID-19. RT-PCR is not a gold standard for COVID-19. In reality, RT-PCR has only 50 to 70% sensitiv sensitivity, depending upon the specimen site. Truly uh, speaking, only gene sequencing by NGS can be regarded as gold. Um, Joseph also mentioned about uh, gene sequencing, uh, but uh, and uh, told that it was used in Germany also. But there are problems with gene sequencing because it is extensive, it is expensive, and it is uh, involves a lot of expertise. So uh, everybody cannot do it. So RT-PCR became the most commonly used uh, gold standard in research studies. Although uh, in in China. There was a paper from Shanghai that they did uh, uh, NGS gene, gene sequencing in all the patients who were RT-PCR negative. So if RT-PCR negative, they did, didn't declare them disease-free. They did and, uh, gene sequencing. And by doing gene sequencing, they, they, they overcome the, uh, this uh, pandemic very quickly in Shanghai. Second question is, uh, A 47-year-old man is suffering from fever and sore throat. He has a history of contact with a patient of COVID-19. His lab investigation results showed HCPCR is normal, uh, HSPCRP is normal, IL-6 is normal, procalcitonin is normal, ferritin is normal, and COVID antibodies, they are negative, antigen is also negative, and they didn't do PCR. What should be the next action in this patient? Antibodies should be repeated. Uh, acute phase reactants should be monitored on daily basis. DNIMS should be carried out. No test is required. COVID-19 is ruled out. RT-PCR should be done. So please write your, uh, what do you think is the best answer on your paper and then wait for the best answer. Yes, RT-PCR should be done. So second myth is uh, that Biomarkers can be used for the diagnosis of COVID-19. Some people, uh, if they get symptoms, they go and get those in Pakistan, especially I'm not saying in other countries in Pakistan, they would go to the to a private lab and get their uh, those five, six tests done instead of getting PCR. And if they are negative, they say we are not having COVID. In reality, biomarkers should only be used for the monitoring of an already diagnosed patient of COVID-19. Currently, most suitable and reliable test is RT-PCR. There is no doubt about that. HRCT, which is a radiological investigation, is also very useful, but it is not in the purview of today's talk because uh, it, it is a separate uh, topic from the radiology department. Question number three is a 39-year-old woman is suffering from fever and joint pains. Her lab investigation revealed CRP is raised, IL-6 is raised, procalcitonin is normal, ferritin is raised, antibodies are normal and uh, negative, antigens is negative, and RT-PCR is negative. What should be the next action in this patient? Should we start with uh, docilozumab, ectomera, or antibodies should be repeated? Dexamethorchone should be started immediately, other viral diseases should be ruled out, RT-PCR should be repeated weekly for two weeks. What do you think is the best answer? In five seconds, just write your answer. One, two, three, four, five. So the best answer is, yes, uh, some of you might have been uh, written the best answer. Other viral diseases should be ruled out. Myth number three is, biomarkers are specific for COVID-19. Yes, this is a very common 
think that if biomarkers are raised, it is COVID-19, whereas reality is it is not. But these biomarkers are not at all specific for COVID-19. They are raised in many infections, inflammation and malignancies. Um, you, you may have a viral infection, you may have a, a thyroiditis and all these markers may be raised. Myth number four is that uh, HSCRP is the first biomarker to rise in infections in COVID-19. HSCRP is a very good marker, but does it uh, rise first? No. First marker to uh, rise is IL-6 uh, hours before the HSCRP. This is very important. Why? We, we will see in the subsequent slides. So interleukin is a cytokine that causes induction of various acute phase reaction. So it is the mother uh, cytokine which causes release of other uh, biomarkers such as uh, CRP and uh, procalcitonin. So IL-6 increases much earlier than CRP. IL-6 is a multifunctional cytokine that transmits cell signals and regulates immune cells. It's a multifunctional uh, cytokine. IL-6 is of major immune importance because of its pleiotropic effect. Pleiotropic means multiple uh, effects. It is, this is a wonderful cytokine. It uh, circulating IL-6 levels are closely linked to the severity of COVID-19 infection. Due to its rapid replication, SARS-CoV-2 virus shows an elevated response of IL-6-induced severe respiratory distress. Serial monitoring uh, is also important. First, on the initial evaluation, IL-6 should be done and then it should be monitored serially. Potential benefits to assess worsening clinical features and disease progression in COVID-19. And one very important uh, indication of uh, IL-6 is the, that it can be very helpful in early diagnosis of impending cytokine, cytokine storm, uh, storm syndrome, CSX. Cytokine storm syndrome uh, is a very dangerous and uh, almost lethal uh, phenomena which occurs in, uh, in COVID-19. And IL-6 is a marker that can be used because it is very, very high maybe 1,000 fold above uh, the normal. Several large studies have reported markedly raised uh, IL-6, and but some authors have denied uh, the, the, the even the existence of CSS in COVID-19, and some have also denied any role of IL-6. In science, uh, all type of opinion that goes on, and one cannot uh, uh, stick to one opinion. CRP, CRP is a a uh, well-known marker, time-honored marker uh, of uh, infection, any infection, viral, or uh, it's a non-specific acute phase reactant. Sensitivity, uh, sensitive biomarker for inflammation, infection, and tissue damage. It starts as in four to six hours and peaks by 36 to uh, 50 hours. Ele elevated CRP, a marker of bacterial or viral, both. It is not uh, specific for viral. In COVID-19 patients, CRP more than 42 milligram per liter. Uh, are more likely to develop. For my younger colleagues, please concentrate on the units uh, of CRP which is used. Now, this is a very, very important point. Uh, this is also a point of for patient safety because two types of units are used, milligram per liter and milligram per deciliter. If you are using milligram per liter, then the lower cutoff is uh, five. But if you are using milligram per deciliter, it is, it is 0.5. So never, never, uh, ignore the units which the lab is using. Procalcitonin is a glycoprotein without hormonal activity. It's, it's very interesting that it, it is a precursor of a hormone which is secreted from the thyroid gland. Procalcitonin gene, but its gene has been found in other tissues like liver, kidney, adipocyte, pancreas, and other uh, tissues. Procalcitonin is also activated by IL-6. So its mother cytokine is IL-6. The PCT is activated by gamma interferon. It is not activated by gamma. This, I think students should remember this, that it is not activated by gamma interferon. And that's why it's it's not a viral uh, marker. It is not a viral marker. It's a marker of bacterial disease because gamma interferon is a uh, cytokine from uh, uh, for viral infections. PCT levels are increased in bacterial infections, therefore can be used to distinguish between bacterial and viral infection. The higher the PCT levels in COVID-19, uh, patients may indicate concomitant bacterial infection. Ferritin, 
ferritin uh, is a wonderful friend all the clinical chemists chemical pathologists they are very uh, friendly with ferritin it's a very good marker of iron deficiency in nearly 100% specificity but its role as apr is marred by the fact that its rise may not be prominent if there is a concomitant now the in countries like pakistan third world countries uh, their uh, iron deficiency is rampant so one should be very careful um, if you are when you are monitoring the patient uh, on the basis of ferritin in covid 19 mostly increase in patient with covid 19 useful biomarker for the intensity of inflammation in patient with covid 19 can be considered to have a good ability to predict poor outcomes so uh, this has been reported in january 2021 Uh, this cartoon depicts the relationship between IL-6 CRP and PCT. IL-6, uh, uh, as I said, it is the mother uh, biomarker and which uh, cytokine and it causes release of CRP and PCT. So uh, that's why IL-6 is raised prior to the CRP and PCT. Then another biomarker, D-dimer, which was introduced in 1990 as a fibrin fibrin degradation product. small protein fragments in blood post fibrinolysis contains 2d fragments and it is useful in range of thrombotic uh, pathologies you can see in dvt in pulmonary embolism it is raised uh, recently it has been reported to be elevated in patient with covid 19 and some reports have shown that even without pulmonary and edema or dvt uh, which means deep vein thrombosis uh, the dimer is raised uh, now the, uh, i will show you whether this fact is true or not lactate dehydrogenases by the way uh, it is uh, it's a new abbreviation is ld not ldh so ld is an enzyme that produces energy ld enzyme catalyzes the conversion of lactate to pyruvic acid and uh, uh, its clinical significance you all know that is a marker of anemia megaloblastic anemia in cancers germ cell tumors ovarian cancers lymphoma leukemia and neuroblastoma so the wide range of diseases in which uh, ld is raised in covid 19 uh, there were reports that uh, there is a, if it is raised there is six fold increase odds of severe covid 19 and another report showed a more than 16 fold increase in odds of mortality but uh, this is these are just few reports which showed uh, the role of covid 19 in uh, ld in covid 19 now a uh, little bit of methodology because uh, i am a lab man so uh, i i think it is quite appropriate that we should uh, have a passing remarks on the methods as estimation of the, these biomarkers in larger labs uh, is done on the chemiluminescence assays uh, one should select a, a one platform uh, for many of them like um, maglumi from china alexis cobas architect abert and others any elisa system they are also available but uh, the specificity and sense to your elisa is much lower than uh, chemiluminescence uh, in a presentation in a webinar on 13 july i will discuss the compare different methods of uh, uh, antibody testing for covid 19 if you are working in a small lab or you require an urgent an urgent test in emergency situation then there is another uh, instrument by the name of fine care from one fu it is not a uh, ict i tell you it is not uh, ict it is uh, amino fluorescence um, I, I, uh, some even the technical people didn't know it they, they said it is a rapid method uh, test yes it is rapid but it is not lateral flow it is not ict it is a uh, amino fluorescence system amino fluorescence is a good technique and the advantage is that it gives you good you know, good result with optimum uh, uh, optimum accuracy so we can do many um, biomarkers on on uh, this system uh, just a passing remarks about the abgs blood gases uh, blood gases are very important test in uh, in in covid 19 patients uh, we, we 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 can have a separate full talk on abgs uh, role of blood gases uh, in various diseases and this is a wonderful system of one for Uh, uh, which I have been using for last two years. Uh, it is cartridge based and we're quite useful for uh, uh, for labs with low turnover. My uh, biomarkers in COVID nineteen epidemic local experience. We analyze estimation of biomarkers in about two sixty five patients of 
uh, COVID-19 patients included both indoor and OPD patients. Repeat and by, by, by the way, OPD means outpatient departments who are not admitted. Repeat analysis of these uh, markers range from one to nine. So in some patients, just one test in two, three, or maybe up to nine. Outcome measures is percentage of positive rates, that is frequency of high levels of biomarkers as compared to the cutoff value. So uh, we, uh, we analyzed our lab data and we found that IL-6 uh, had the highest positivity rate, 62%. Now, uh, please remember this fact that if a, one patient is admitted and his initial, his or her initial IL-6 is raised, subsequently uh, his or her all IL-6 will be uh, raised gradually coming down. So that's why it is uh, it has shown the best uh, sensitivity or best positivity rate, followed by ferritin and then uh, CRP. PCT uh, was not raised in much of the patients. LD was uh, only in 14% and D dimer uh, only in 8%. So we can infer that many biochemical parameters were significantly different between the severe and mild groups. Only CRP, IL-6 and ferritin levels were found to be pathologically elevated. So uh, we can classify that these are good markers. And similar finding was reported from China uh, in New England Journal of Medicine uh, in two, uh, last year. They, they also uh, found that these three markers, they, they were quite good uh, for COVID-19. Then some markers were very uh, had specific indications. If you suspect a bacterial infection, then you go should go for procalcitonin. I, I will not advise. I will not recommend procalcitonin in all the patients, other in only in those patients who whom you suspect uh, a concomitant bacterial infection. DU dimer should also be done only for the uh, those patients with uh, have some hematological disturbances, which can be evident from uh, blood CBC. Um, coagulation profile, et cetera, on, only then d dimers should be advised, not across uh, the board to all for all the patients. LD, I found no advantage. LD testing is useful, is not useful, it is useless. LD estimation provides no additional information and has almost no role in COVID-19, should not be used. So it is an ugly biomarker. So my take home message is biomarkers should be used according to the uh, according to the uh, situation of the patient, not in all patients. Use of all the biomarkers across the board in COVID-19 patients merely results in wastage of precious uh, resources. Uh, rational use of biomarkers will effectively reduce the cost of the patient care. And the, in the part of the world from where I'm speaking, the economy is always very important and we want to cut uh, the expenses which are uh, which we can do and instead diverting our funds too. So I always uh, advise my colleagues, uh, laboratory colleagues to please divert their funds to the better markers rather than doing, um, and rather than doing the, uh, just traditional all the markers. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Professor Amir. Thank you very much both for your knowledge and your uh, story. And now I'm pretty sure that uh, we all have gained a better understanding of uh, which bell markers that were recommended to use in the clinical management of COVID-19. So and then we shall proceed to a Q&A session. And here I got several questions which I collected during this uh, presentation uh, for two experts. So the first question is for Dr. Joseph. So we saw the strategy you showed at September last year in Germany, the antigen test is used before the PCR and positive antigen patients should be sent for later PCR confirmation, right? And some of our audience asked, what about the negative antigen test? And which means what to do with the negative patients? So usually the assumption is um, the negative patient is negative. Of course, we all know uh, due to a low viral load, sometimes the rapid test will not show a positive result, although the person can already infect other people. So what now happens is that most of the time, people are required to take one PCR test per week if they are in certain professions, 
independently of the case, uh, independently if uh, of the case if the rapid test is negative or not. So a positive rapid test will always be followed through immediately. The negative tests, uh, which have to happen, for example, for people in elderly care, every second day, they will also do a once a week a PCR test just to be on the safe side. But usually, the, the, then the rapid test will be trusted, of course. And if there are symptoms and the rapid test is negative, there's still a PCR will be performed. Okay, thank you for your answer. And uh, our next question is still for you, Dr. Joseph. Um, we know your lab has did the validation study of our antigen test, and I think uh, it is the needle swab. And we really appreciate your effort, and I do hope it could meet your standard for real world application. Um, so our question is, what could be the main consideration when choosing antigen tests for COVID-19 testing? And what should we do before applying to real situation? Um, so I'm not sure if I understand the question now correctly. So you mean- yeah, I, can, uh, sorry, I can further explain uh, by the main consideration of choosing antigen tests because we know that there are a lot of uh, like uh, from antigen tests that from uh, different manufacturers. So um, we wonder um, what aspects would you pay attention to? Like specificity, sensitivity? I know these two indicators, they must be the higher the better, but what about other, other aspects? Like so in terms of other aspects, in, of course, in terms of the general reliability that the test produces a result quickly. And of course, from different manufacturers, still the tests are very comparable. So uh, it will be about what features you can use as an add-on to make it more useful uh, for the people. So it can be a quicker result, also a way of having the result available in a digital way rather quickly, so that it can be used as a proof that uh, you are negative or allowed to access certain areas where you cannot go without having a, a, a recent test result. So if there would be a way to bring the result more or less immediately in a smart way onto the smartphone or so, then this would be a big a plus compared to other tests. The applicability, if you do the, uh, the swap in the nose or the mouth or uh, by, um, there are different methods. Um, they are all now quite established and everyone prefers something different. So it will not really be possible to have something that is the perfect fit for everyone because everyone prefers other methods of taking the probe. But uh, generally the population for each of this type is very big anyway. So generally the added features, what comes in terms of convenience with the test being performed would really be key. Okay. So, and also uh, because the, in, at the moment all these tests, the, the officially performed tests are being paid for by the government. So pricing is not necessarily the biggest issue, but rather what you get with the whole package. And also maybe the ease of performing the test rather quickly for many people would be a good help. Okay, thank you for your answer. Um, and next question is for Professor Amir. Um, from your speech, you have introduced in detail about the interleukin-6. And it is indeed a marker that has been widely applied for COVID-19 patients. And now there are two questions related to interleukin-6. The first one is um, about the application of interleukin-6. Can we depend interleukin-6 alone for predicting the disease progress? Uh, thank you very much for this question. Very important question. No, you cannot depend alone on it. Uh, as I told you, at least three biomarkers should be used, IL-6, HSCRP, and uh, ferritin. Uh, the the uh, distinguishing feature of IL-6 is that it is an early marker uh, for respiratory distress. And secondly, if it is very, very high, it shows you impending uh, cytokine uh, storm syndrome, and if you are, uh, it has gone, it has gone up to the 
more than 80 or 100 uh, 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 picogram per ml, then one should consider using a biological agent like Actimera uh, to selizumab. Uh, and so that was, although some people have uh, recommended not to use Actimera now, but uh, some people, but others are still using Actimera. So one indication of IL-6 is uh, using in um, uh, for monitoring of patients uh, who have got CSS. But one, uh, another important uh, advice to my junior clinical colleagues that if you are if you are monitoring a patient of uh, uh, clinical this is strong syndrome, then uh, IL-6 uh, monitoring it should not be done because uh, <coughs> this Actimera is not anti-IL-6. It is anti-IL-6 receptors. So it will block the receptors. It will not reduce the production of IL-6. But uh, the indication is that you, when you should start it. Uh, but when you have to stop it, uh, IL-6 is not in best test for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the next question is, is also related to interleukin-6. And uh, this audience asks, uh, should we test interleukin-6 for suspected or antigen confirmed cases at primary care setting? No, I, I will not. No, no, no. I will not recommend that uh, uh, for primary care setting. If only antigen is positive, uh, IL-6 is indicated in only in those patients who are clearly RT positive, PCR positive, and have got uh, the symptoms uh, and uh, HRCT score of uh, uh, having the pneumonia or uh, which, which means the ground glass uh, opacities, GTOs, only in those cases, IL-6 should be advised. Usually these patients are admitted in, in the hospitals. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next question is for both Professor Amia and uh, Dr. Shiver. Yes, and since the vaccination is going actively all over the world and uh, could you please share the current vaccination strategy in your country? And uh, how will the popularity of vaccines affect the later testing strategies? Um, maybe Dr. Joseph, you, you start first. Okay, so thank you very much. So at the initially here we had um, prioritization strategy, um, four different tiers where people were sorted into depending on their personal risk to have a triaging that the people being most at risk, so people being older than 80 and so on, and workers working with them, got the first doses. And then uh, basically this has been worked through uh, the different uh, priority group. Uh, that the start was not very efficient here in Germany, so it was a rather slow start. And there were some problems with the AstraZeneca vaccine and being not that popular despite having also good um, results. So at the moment in Germany, uh, four uh, vaccines are being used. Um, this is um, Pfizer-BioNTech, BioNTech being a German company, which is the major part of the vaccination campaign. And then you have uh, Ast AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, then um, Moderna and um, Johnson Johnson, and also the state here now acquired some doses from Sputnik from the Russian vaccine. And so since actually since yesterday, uh, the vaccine uh, is the vaccination is accessible for everyone basically on short notice. Uh, so after the priority groups, everyone who wanted to get the vaccine got one, and now everyone can sign up and usually gets an appointment within two or three days now, which will help us from the, so we, when this structured campaign uh, was run through until uh, two days ago, we are now at a vaccination rate of around 53, 54%. And now we will likely that the objective is to be around at around 70% by end of the month. And then of course the problem comes with some people not wanting to be vaccinated and so on, but it seems to be a percentage of less than 15%. So we will likely be able to get to a, ra a ratio of around 85% vaccination uh, around uh, late, late August. So we are in absolute numbers. Uh, 
vaccinating, for example, more people per day than the US, despite having only a fifth of the population. So this is going very effective now. And this will affect the testing strategy. So uh, because, as you know, um, with this new Delta variant, um, it's not that new anymore, but um, now the first case is being reported also here in Germany. Um, it will still be tested quite heavily because even vaccinated people can transmit, although the cases are usually relatively mild. Some exceptions are always there, of course. So uh, I assume the test, they actually, the government announced yesterday that the number of weekly tests in schools will be even increased because the younger people are, have a lower vaccination rate. So uh, I see the, the next quarter, rather, there will be more tests for less cases to be able to then track, really track down the, the now a really small number of cases in the country to be able to hopefully be able at some point to really more or less get completely rid of the virus, which will be driven by tests and vaccination. So there's of course also the discussion having a third shot of the vaccine if this is necessary as a booster. So uh, the vaccines for that have been acquired already. And apparently this will also affect, so this really depends on how the different virus strains and so on will develop in the future. Uh, but the testing will remain for a while at more or less the level. And if we can get to the point that the self tests are more linked to a certificate, this will be even further increased because still uh, for the different centers, uh, they are completely reimbursed by the state, which is <laughs> of course decreases the bird to get the test because everyone can go there, just show up and get the test immediately. And uh, this will rather go up for people being cautious. But hopefully at some point we will be at the uh, everywhere in the country at COVID zero, so that is not no, no longer necessary. Okay. Thank you for your sharing. And Professor Amir, you, you can share your opinions. In Pakistan, uh, once again, uh, we were very lucky to have a great neighbor, China, and they uh, immediately supplied us as a donation, um, I think more than a million doses of Sinopharm. So we started with the Sinopharm. Uh, I uh, myself has been vaccinated two, two doses of Sinopharm, which has been approved by WHO also. Then we have got another Chinese vaccine, which is Sinovac. Uh, uh, my wife is vaccinated with Sinovac. And, uh, and we have also started producing uh, and our own vaccine by the name of Sparkvac, um, of course, with the uh, collaboration of China. And uh, these are the three Chinese vaccines which are very commonly used in our country. But AstraZeneca, uh, we are also using it, especially for those people who want to travel abroad and uh, uh, Pfizer also for travelers. About the testing, I think the uh, best way to test the effectiveness of uh, vaccine is uh, testing the spike proteins. But uh, I will not recommend testing with spike proteins in all the patients because it is not necessary. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, so um, I actually have a question is about neutralizing antibody. So if coronavirus is going to coexist with us for a uh, quite long time. And do you think the neutral, uh, neutralizing antibody test is going to be an uh, inevitable trend? Like we, uh, the majority of people will have to test this. Um, what's your opinion okay. on this? Uh, this is a very good question. And many people ask in, about the neutralizing antibody. Uh, first, let me be, uh, make it clear. What is actually neutralizing antibody? Actually neutral, neutralizing antibodies are very method, uh, methodological tests, very difficult tests, which are done in the lab and uh, on the virus grown on, uh, on cells. And they see that whether this antibody neutralize the viruses or not. So, uh, and it cannot be used uh, in clinical set settings. So first be clear that actually neutralizing antibodies are those uh, which are done uh, on virus culture. So what are these, what are the neutralizing antibodies which we got 
here in uh, which is called nab uh, in clean they are these uh, the markers they are the uh, the the uh, the markers which, which has been standardized against the neutralizing antibodies they are not actually neutralizing but they have been uh, they have been uh, standardized against the neutralizing antibodies yes i agree with you they are very good test and especially for the uh, those patient who want to see their effectiveness of vaccine thank you thank you very much for your answer so we got uh, another question for dr joseph it is um <coughs> Uh, do you think with the positive new case daily below 1,000 in Germany, um, do you think PCR test will prevail antigen to be more widely as COVID positivity rate is low now? I understand these questions because I don't quite understand it. I'm not exactly sure. I'm just reading it. Oh, oh, oh so, you want me to repeat it? No, I'm just reading it here myself. That's fine. I oh, saw it. Okay. Oh. Um, there will still be because the official requirement for the health authorities is a person is post COVID positive with a positive PCR test. The rapid test is an indication for that, but not yet the official diagnosis. When you have a PCR test, also the whole thing with the contact tracement, um, a quarantine and so on is being triggered, which is not being triggered by a plain uh, uh, rapid test result. So both of them have their use cases in the future. And I believe it will be stronger on the rapid test side just to find the occasional case that is still there and will inevitably come up again because um, you can easily travel everywhere now. Uh, but still, uh, the, post, the PCR, so both of them will be used in the future. And I think rather the number of rapid tests will be higher and the PCRs will be more focused uh, for. Um, uh, certain occasions, but there are still some countries that require a 48 hour old PCR test or so to be able to enter. So this will also continue for a while. So it will be interesting how this will be in about a month, but at the moment we will rather be at a very similar level. So that's the end of the answer. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. I hope this audience has uh, got the answer he wants. So uh, due to our time limit, we'll only have one more question for Professor Amia. The usage of D-dimer seems to increase rapidly in his country, this audience, uh, audience that. Um, so when should we test the D-dimer for COVID-19 patients? Uh, good question. I think uh, D-dimer should not be used in all the COVID patients, whether they are admitted or not. Now, if there are some hematological indications such as uh, uh, abnormalities in the uh, complete blood count or there are coagulation profile abnormalities, only then D-dimers should be used because it is a marker of uh, DIC or hematological disorders. It is not a direct marker of uh, COVID because, because it is known, well known that COVID-19 has got hematological effects. So, but in, not in all patients, not at all. So using D-dimer in all the patients, I will not recommend. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your answer. So due to the time limit, uh, we should, our Q&A session has to end here sadly. Um, okay. So Dr. Joseph and Professor Amir did provided us with a lot of information and inspiring thoughts. And wonderful Beltech kept working on to present the most satisfying and complete COVID-19 solution since the beginning of the COVID-19 and no matter for testing or clinical management. So as you can see from this slide, wonderful's product list covers from diagnosis to clinical management to end to post-vaccination screening. Um, for diagnosis, we have real-time PCR antigen and antibody tests. Our real-time PCR assay targets on both regular coronavirus and identified variants. 
Room temperature storage and ready to use reagents can greatly improve the testing capacity. And for antigen tests to meet requirements of different application scenario, uh, we also uh, provide test kits that use different sample types, including nasal pharyngeal or pharyngeal nasal saliva sputum. And we also provide influenza and the COVID-19 antigen combo test to help the initial differenti uh, differential diagnosis accurately guide the further clinical decision. Um, for antibody tests, we have test kits that can detect total antibody tests. Um, and IgM, IgG, that based on colloidal gold platform and fine care fluorescence immune, uh, say, platform respectively. When it comes to clinical management, Wonderful provides solutions on three platforms, uh, namely fine care fluorescence, uh, the second one is uh, dry chemistry platform and electrochemistry. For the uh, biomarker, Professor uh, Amir just mentioned, like interleukin-6, ferritin, CRP, PCT, and D-dimer are available on fine care platform. And LDH can be achieved on dry chemistry platform. A blood gas analyzer and optical coagulation analyzer are from our electrochemistry platform. And blood gas analyzer can make a comprehensive assessment of the patient's physical condition by measuring the most complete indicators. And coagulation analyzer can help to evaluate coagulation that may experience by COVID-19 patients. For post-vaccination screening, we provide RBD antibody and neutralizing antibody based on colloidal gold, fine care fluorescence and chemiluminescence platform respectively, which we hope could assist vaccination program. Um, if I'm gonna use one sentence to conclude this, epidemic evolves, our wonderful also evolves and always try to be better. And here we almost come to, come to the end of the webinar. Again, thank Dr. Joseph and um, Professor Amir for sharing their insights with us and thank all the attendees for joining Wonderful Biotech. We hope you have learned and enjoyed this webinar. Also thank Wonderful Biotech for presenting this webinar and giving us this opportunity to have conversations with experts in this field. And Wonderful Biotech will host another webinar focusing hotspot issues during post-vaccination era in mid-July. And we are looking forward to everyone's participation. Um, also, you can follow the Wonderful's official account on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook to acquire latest information of Wonderful. And lastly, we will have a e-certificate sent to each of uh, our attendees for showing our gratitude for your time and participation. Uh, for any question you raised uh, during webinar, if your questions are still remain unanswered, we will collect and deliver them uh, to our expert. Yes, and you can send all your questions to us uh, through this email. Yeah. And uh, yes, uh, we will convey all your questions to our two experts and get back to you as soon as possible. So um, see you next time, maybe in mid-July. This is the end of the webinar. Thank you all for participation. Thank you, Professor Amia and Dr. Joseph. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Everybody is uh, free to leave the Zoom. <clears throat> Bye. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Amber. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. Very interesting sharing. Thank you.